So, um, uh, my understanding is that today I'll be giving you an overview of um, uh, one approach to addressing the issue of child and behavior, child and adolescent uh, behavior problems. Um, I want to talk today about a general approach to um, to developing interventions, empirically based interventions that. Uh, reduce uh, mental health problems in children and adolescents. And I want to present this as an overall approach, uh, one that is always in process and always being refined and improved. The approach I'm going to be talking about is what I call a model building approach, where um, uh, information about uh, in, uh, interventions that could uh, prevent or treat conduct problems are developed through a variety of uh, evidence bases. And the first is the field observation. Uh, one, one venue of field observation is clinical work with children and adolescents. Another is um, uh, you know, qualitative studies. But that uh, leads to the development, to the uh, um, identification of key constructs. And key constructs are then uh, tested in longitudinal uh, process models, and then we design an intervention experiment to test those constructs, and then again, field observation. So one example of a construct that has emerged from field observations was parent monitoring uh, or adult monitoring. Uh, that idea had been identified in many uh, studies on the etiology of delinquent behavior, but um, hadn't really been incorporated in most treatment approaches to uh, conduct problems or oppositional defiance. So in, our, in the early 80s, uh, myself and colleagues uh, like Jerry Patterson and others identified the construct of uh, pair monitoring and then incorporated that in our longitudinal studies and then eventually design intervention experiments that were designed to increase parent monitoring. Um, and that resulted in reductions in problem behavior in kids. Now, um, another construct that has emerged in the same way is positive behavior support. Uh, an idea that um, is linked to the um, uh, work, uh, to behavioral work with kids but really came out of uh, Rob Horner and George Sugai's uh, systematic observations of schools, um, uh, observing that many public schools are uh, take a punishment approach to dealing with problem behavior with kids, and uh, they identify positive behavior support as a potential alternative, and uh, have designed entire systems of intervention around increasing uh, positive behavior support, which is shown to be empirically effective. So that's by way of introduction. Um, uh, four goals of this talk today. One is to provide a rationale for family-centered interventions to the treatment of uh, problem behavior. Sorry. Um, and the other is to provide an overview of the family checkup model for addressing problem behavior and comorbidities. And then to review findings from randomized trials on the effectiveness of the FCU family checkup uh, with families of young children and adolescents, and then finally discuss future directions of the family checkup model to improve the intervention effectiveness and to address comorbidity. And before I start, I want to just um, make sure that we're on the same page about this idea that uh, many of the um, emotional difficulties and challenges as well as the behavioral difficulties and challenges that children and families experience are, are related. So it's probably not um, uh, wise to approach them uh, from the diagnostic point of view as distinct uh, diseases but rather as a uh, spectrum of difficulties that are correlated and that also means that the solution, uh, one solution could probably reduce uh, both problem behavior as well as emotional distress among kids and families. So we're not talking about different interventions for different outcomes. 
that's an idea that seems to be difficult to um, completely um, capture in the United States because our funding organizations and our institutes are organized, organized around disorders. So we tend to, uh, each group of researchers tends to design interventions for unique uh, uh, child and uh, adolescent adjustment indices. So um, we have difficulty here uh, using an integrated approach to address these various problems. So um, in terms of uh, an integrated approach, uh, developmental research has suggested that s many of the more severe types of um, issues that we see in adolescents don't come out of uh, come out of a don't come out of a vacuum. That there's a long developmental sequence leading to um, the outcomes of more severe uh, violence and problem behavior, or even drug use or sexual promiscuity in adolescents. And that um, process leading to that outcome is often referred to as a cascade model, a cascade sequence, whereas in early childhood, relatively normal child defiance or problems in self-regulation that are not really of concern uh, and don't really predict strongly adolescent outcomes can lead to adolescent outcomes through this cascading process of actions and reactions. And the first step in um, the cascade sequence is that children with relatively minor levels of defiance and self-regulation tend to accumulate academic skill deficits, tend to be disliked by peers, um, and tend to um, self-organize as early as uh, kindergarten, fifth, uh, age five or age six in elementary school. Systematic research by Jim Snyder on playgrounds uh, in public schools in the United States shows that the kids self-organize into groups and begin at a very early age to start mocking adult deviant behavior and laughing about it. And those little subclusters uh, tend to grow over time uh, into adolescence where you get phenomenon like gangs or um, peer groups that are intensely supportive of multiple forms of problem behavior. And this sequence tells us a lot about that process leading to severe problem behaviors through childhood and adolescence. Now the, the black portion of the figure is um, suggestive that family management is a key factor in reducing risk all the way through development from early childhood, childhood, and adolescence. And it also communicates the idea that the longer we wait, the more likely it is that the family will have limited uh, uh, ability to uh, alter the course of development. So that's the cascade model. And core to the cascade model is this idea of a coercion cycle. Almost all forms of child and adolescent psychopathology have conflict as uh, a generating or amplifying mechanism, family conflict. So um, how is it that conflict generates or amplifies uh, child behavior problems or mental health problems? The coercion model uh, originally developed by Jerry Patterson describes that sequence in, in very um, fine detail. First, the child engages in some kind of problem behavior, then the parent reacts emotionally, and then the child might be, uh, escalate, and then eventually the, chair, the parent withdraws. Uh, they try, they withdraw their attempts to manage their kids, um, and or they escalate. Um, and what comes from that is an amplifying process where the mi relatively minor problems can become significantly worse. Now, that happens at the second by second level, but also happens over time, so you can actually watch a parent from age two to age six withdraw their demands on a child because of the past unsuccessful attempts to manage. By adolescence, um, you find that parents are even less likely to engage in treatment approaches that emphasizes their role, partly because they feel like in the past, their efforts to socialize have been unsuccessful. So this brings up the idea of family management because the opposite of that is when parents are more planful and proactive and uh, don't uh, react emotionally and have a, a management plan and, and when parents tend to do that then most of these minor 
behavior problems don't amplify and escalate to more major mental health problems. And this concept uh, in, uh, in this figure uh, suggests that family management is a mediator of economic stress, social stress, uh, parent substance use, and parent depression and marital conflict. All of those factors certainly have an impact on kids, children's outcomes, but the, they tend to be mediated by family management. So uh, family management is a key variable to focus in on an, as one arm of an intervention strategy designed to reduce the prevalence of child and adolescent uh, behavior problems or mental health problems. And um, the literature is, is vast in this area. There's probably at least 100 randomized intervention studies showing that uh, for uh, families who come into a clinic and say, I, my child has a behavior problem, that interventions that emphasize family management uh, are shown to reduce child behavior problems, uh, reduce middle childhood uh, problem behavior, and also reduce adolescent problem behavior. We know that from the clinical randomized trials. Now the only problem is that the clinical randomized trials take parents that are identifying their children as problematic. However, if we want to have a public health impact, we need to um, realize that many, many families out there in the community don't identify either their parenting or their child's behavior as problematic. So to engage parents into uh, effective, uh, empirically supported uh, interventions, you, you need some kind of intervention like a family checkup, which is relatively brief, motivationally oriented, and collaborative, so you can engage the higher risk families in services when they, when they, when they need them. Another um, fact related to um, parent management training uh, that relevant limited public health um, benefits is that about 50% of the kid, the children, adolescents with uh, clear conduct problems uh, have received any kind of support for the conduct problems by the time they're 13 or 14. So 50% of the more severe uh, conduct problems go uh, unattended by uh, any kind of intervention, let alone probably about 10% of those are empirically supported. So it's a huge group of uh, children and families that don't get uh, the services that would be justified based on the child's behavior. So our, our approach on the family checkup is motivation and tailoring parent management training to meet the needs of children. So the key concept is the Prochaska de, Clem de Clemente model, uh, which uh, identifies as the stage of change um, as, a, as a variety of stages. And the key insight of Prochaska and De Clemente is that um, where the client is or where the parent is um, dictates the type of intervention we need. So a parent that is in a pre-contemplation stage, which means that basically they don't see their own behavior as relevant to their child's behavior, um, requires a somewhat different approach than a parent who might uh, be open to uh, their behavior being relevant. So if you look at the um, pre-contemplation, if someone isn't, if a parent isn't sure that they are particularly relevant to their child's or adolescent's mental health problem, the therapist should spend time questioning, uh, asking about situations that went well or that did not go well and those types of questions will help um, evoke the parent's reflective uh, capacity in their own role in the, uh, in the child's uh, behavior problems. So that would be the strategy used for someone who's in pre-contemplation. For someone who's in a contemplation stage, that means they realize that they don't always engage in the best parenting practices. Then you might want to question them about the pros and cons of them changing how they're parenting and uh, discuss with them the benefits of what they're doing now versus the cons and have them decide for themselves whether they want to change. If a parent happens to come to you and they're prepared to make changes um, or they're 
they're considering making changes, then you ask them about the success and failures of past efforts to change. And then finally, uh, the action stage, which is the vast majority of our clinical outcome studies presume that parents are in the action stage. That's when they might be ready for uh, support, uh, for advice uh, and support. Parents in the pre-contemplation stage don't want advice, nor do they in the contemplation stage you have to get them ready to uh, provide advice. It's not that advice is bad, it's just that the client isn't quite ready for it. And then maintenance, of course, is um, if, if a parent has made some positive changes, then they benefit most from um, supporting their successes and uh, problem solving potential failures down the road. So that's the stages of change. Now I'm gonna go directly and describe what, what the family checkup is. So the way we've developed and tested the family checkup, it's a three uh, session intervention. Each session is about 50 minutes. It involves an initial interview, which is an initial contact with the, with the caregiver, um, engaging in the motivational interviewing process that I just described, and motivating them more or less to um, engage in an assessment. The second session is the assessment session and that's again 50 minutes to an hour um, and where we assess the child and adolescent the child and adolescents uh, adjustment as well as the parenting practices as well as the peer and the school ecology we try to do that efficiently but broadly and then the last session is a feedback and planning session the feedback and planning session is very critical because this is where you work with families to engage them in the kinds of interventions that are most likely to be successful. And those include uh, four options, uh, either a brief tailored uh, parent management training, which might be one or two sessions on a specific topic, uh, family management uh, treatment, parent management treatment where we would meet with them regularly on uh, more than one, one topic. Um, occasionally we have child CBT cognitive behavioral therapy uh, directly for especially for adolescents if we have a depressed adolescent we would work on both the family and the and then also with the child and then community resources so for some of our families uh, in the states in the, in the US communities they are um, this is the second or third generation of uh, disadvantage and they require much more intensive resources the caregivers are barely intact, so we um, set them up so that they are engaged in the community resources to provide longer term support to try to, as, as much as possible, address the parenting practices as well as um, make sure that the family is more viable in the future. So those are the three steps. Now the three steps of the family checkup, it's a building process. So the initial interview sets the stage for the assessment session which sets the stage for the feedback session. And underlying that is um, become, as you move, work with the family through these three steps, you become much more focused and, and clear about what the needs of the family are. And that's what we call case conceptualization. So the parent consultant develops a, uh, a case conceptualization that will help them target uh, intervention services that best need, meet their specific needs. So I'm going to go through each of those phases in some detail uh, so that you get a better sense of the overall intervention strategy. So the initial interview um, does involve a uh, specific task. Um, it, and these tasks are almost obvious, introducing yourself and explain the family checkup process. Uh, you respond to family questions. You get to know the family by exploring strengths, problem areas, and concerns. Um, and then you motivate to engage in the assessment and schedule future meetings. So we meet only briefly with the child, um, but mostly with the parents, primarily. Yeah. We uh, initially, when we were developing this model, we developed it for parents of adolescents, and we realized very quickly that we could demotivate the parents by meeting with the adolescent and the parent. So we bring the adolescent only in end when we think we can have a successful inter interchange. So we start with the parents. 
Um, the motivational interviewing skills for the initial interview in, include expressing empathy, uh, which is basic to any intervention for, for caregivers. The, the unique um, aspect of motivational interviewing is for the clinician to be skilled at developing discrepancies. So whenever you talk to basically anybody about a problem that they're having, most people will um, say things that are relatively inconsistent in terms of their motivations. So um, when there is that inconsistency, the, the best thing that we can do for someone is to help uh, point that out in a supportive way by bringing up the discrepancy of what they're saying. Um, on the one hand, you want to let Sammy explore his environment and get messy with his toys. On the other hand, you want him to start listening when you ask him to stop or pick up something. So that's something you might say to a parent, uh, parent of Sammy who um, uh, doesn't want to control their young child on the one hand, on the other hand, is annoyed that the child doesn't listen to him when they ask him to pick up. Another example is you'd like to be more positive with Sammy so he'll listen better. And at the same time, you're really stressed, which is making you irritable. The neat thing is that you also know that when Sammy listens, you are less stressed. So that's a more advanced style of developing discrepancy because um, it brings in a bit of reflective listening. And uh, for the parent listening to that, they can accept it or reject it, but hopefully they'll have a better perspective on their own motivation. So those are the key uh, steps for the initial interview. Now let's talk about the assessment session. We call this an ecological assessment because we, we take the approach that a broad-based assessment uh, that's brief is better than a detailed clinical assessment. And that's, that's a bit different from, um, you know, in psychology there's two theories of assessment. One is a deficit model, and the role of the clinician is to explore deeply any kinds of clinical deficits or problems through interviewing or whatever means. The other is that by far the best strategy is to assess everybody on the same thing and get a broader perspective on strengths and weaknesses, and that's the perspective we take, so we call it an ecological assessment. And the goals are to gather information to, to develop case conceptualization, <coughs> accurately identify strengths as well as challenge areas, keep the family engaged in the family checkup process. We reduce intervention time by identifying specific needs and uh, collect information across multiple contexts. Um, so that's, this next slide, basic <coughs> assessment battery, gives us an overview of what we assess. So we have three domains that we're trying to assess. The child's problem behavior and emotional adjustment, the family context, which, and uh, the family management practices or parenting practices. So we get brief reports from the parent, teacher, and child, if it's an adolescent, we get a um, measure of the family context at home. Most of our work is done with home visiting, but we also ask parents basic questions about stress and depression and marital adjustment. Um, and then we um, take a look at uh, family management practices by asking parents uh, to report. And then we videotape the family interacting for about a half an hour. And the videotaping uh, is key to our, our models because we actually give parents some feedback on their videotapes in the feedback session. It's also key to our case conceptualization. We find that videotape interaction, one half hour of videotape interaction is worth more than 100 questionnaires when we're trying to assess uh, what we want. And we have an, a, a videotape uh, tasks that are uh, relevant to early childhood, middle childhood, and adolescence. So we have different tasks for each of these ages. We also have different tasks for a different cultural group. Um, and so that, that all leads to uh, strength-based case conceptualization. And a strength-based case conceptualization is a bit different than a clinical 
case conceptualization because our, our basic task is to <clears throat> identify and think through what the strengths of that caregiving system is. Uh, what have they tried to do? Where have they been successful? What are their goals? What are their intentions? Um, looking for um, uh, strengths that we can build on in our intervention. So um, in that case conceptualization, we're also looking for a story. Uh, you know, for example, uh, a parent uh, that I, uh, I'm just, this is my most recent example, an adolescent family uh, step a father and mother with an adolescent who's about 15 years old. They, um, the child uh, was very likely to be ADHD, very extremely ADHD, really at low impulse control, difficulty attending, difficulty doing academic tasks. These parents, the stepdad came into the family when the child was about two to three years old and now he's 15. And throughout that time they managed that uh, without any medication because they believed strongly that they didn't want to have their child medicated. Whether we agree with that or not, that was their goal and that was their intention. And uh, they um, did a fairly decent job. This, this child is 15 and was was basically passing through uh, school uh, as expected and getting reasonable grades. Why were they at the getting attention now? Well, around age 15, his grades went from uh, Bs and Cs to Ds and Fs, which is a failing grade in the U.S. And so uh, something was happening in the family. And uh, indeed, um, they had a lot of stress and then they were having marital problems and the adolescent was challenging anyway, so it started, the family started to deteriorate. So our case conceptualization was this is a family that had a lot of resources, a lot of uh, motivation to manage a kid's behavior, and now they're at a stress point, a transition point. So we wanted to make sure when we gave them feedback that we uh, understood their story, you know, that understood the story of what they had tried to do and how successful they were. And that was very helpful for engaging them in what they needed to do now. That's an example of uh, tailoring and, and understanding strengths. It doesn't require a lot of data points. It just requires uh, thinking through the assessment and thinking about it in human terms. So um, in the case conceptualization, we're merging the different perspectives, the teacher, the caregiver, the youth's perspective, with our, with our observations. And we come up with a family-centered case conceptualization. That's a, that's a story about what, what's happening with that family and how things can be improved. And uh, just anecdotally, that last case that I described, um, the client actually was uh, seen quite positively by the teachers. He was a likable uh, kid from the teacher's point of view. That actually is another strength when um, the school sees a child as relatively positive, even though they're having significant behavior problems at home, that is, is really a sign that it's much easier to fix than if the school is quite negative about the youth and the parent is both negative about the youth. That's um, more challenging to turn that around. So um, we, when we're thinking about our case conceptualization, we tailor feedback for the client uh, so we are, like I said, creating a story that we think the client will likely understand using terms and concepts that are uh, amenable to the client. We're looking for using the client's words, etc., for making sure that the client will make use of the feedback. Uh, that's the T. The H in the think model is harm reduction as the top priority. So uh, and when you work in the community, you will discover that um, some, a subset of the families have um, a, some domestic violence and or uh, severe neglect or some kind of situation where someone in, is in harm's way. And if that's the case, then our first step is to, is to take measures to reduce the potential that any one family member is going to be hurt in some way or in harm's way. This could also be uh, for adolescents that they're engaging in risk behaviors that are 
<coughs> very, very high risk. And so our first priority would be to manage that risk so that the child doesn't do something self-destructive or hurt somebody else. So that's the kind of the core foundation. The I is integrate information into a parenting frame. So clearly we're interested in getting caregivers or parents to do something different than what they're doing now. And then N is notice and build on parenting strengths. And then K is know and consider functional dynamics in the family. So functional dynamics in the family. Uh, in the case that I just described to you with the stepdad and the mom and the 50-year-old son, the functional dynamics of that family was, was that as the marital distress got worse, um, the father became more strict and more critical. And he had <coughs> good intentions, but his negative emotion was, was overriding his best judgment about how to treat this uh, mm -hmm. adolescent. As he became more strict and critical, mom became more kind and um, and caretaking, and so uh, she started to actually, um, you know, tell the son to ignore what his dad was saying. Don't worry about this or that. And as she did that more often, he actually would increase his harshness. And so that's an example of them working against each other in a way that eventually made the situation much worse. And neither of them were aware really that they were playing into each other in that way. So that's a good example of a functional dynamic. It's very classic for systems family therapists to think in these terms, uh, but we have to think that way as well. So um, when we're giving feedback, of course, we're, we, we may not diagnose a family in terms of their system dysfunction, but we will focus on what they can do to build their family management. And so this figure here reflects the idea that most of our discussions should be around family management. Um, and we, we, we don't spend as much delving into these other uh, potential, potentially important issues such as the marital issues or the um, depression or the life crises, uh, school issues. We weave those into what the parents can do. So for example, in the case I just described, the, the parents had, the stepdad had a father who was um, dying uh, with terminal cancer, and mom had a mother in, in the town that had a severe psychiatric disorder, which was flaring up. Uh, so they had a lot of crisis. Uh, the marriage was, was weak, and so mom was getting more depressed, and that was affecting her parenting. So we didn't go into each one of these areas intensively, but we help them make the dot, connect the dots that these factors were affecting how they're parenting and that they would benefit from working more as a team during this time than they do working against each other. And try to work to get them to um, see it the same way. So this leads us to the feedback delivery, which is um, a uh, process where we're giving now we're sitting down with the family and actually giving them feedback. And um, it's a big mistake to just walk in and start giving a family feedback because that could mobilize their resistance to information. So our first step is to ask them, <coughs> what did you learn about your family going through this, filling out these questionnaires and doing the videotape feedback? We make sure that we get it some kind of answer from them about that because it's really key that the first step in the in the process of giving feedback that the parent is actively engaged in the meeting so that we, we communicate very clearly that they're collaborators in building the story. Then we react with supporting uh, the parents perceptions and validating as much as possible and then we explain kind of our blank feedback profile. We explain how we're going to give them information. Then we include feedback and often we bring a two-minute clip of videotape. Uh, very brief, it doesn't have to be much, but a videotape that um, typically shows what the, what the parents could do, uh, shows them positively engaging with their child, and then if we can, shows them an example of when they 
could have done that skill and they didn't. <coughs> That's the rationale for that kind of feedback is that if someone sees that they have the skill in their repertoire, they're much more likely to, to engage in the solution than if we suggest esoteric skills that they feel are beyond their means or perhaps um, um, not, not wise for them to, to, to engage in. And so then we end the feedback session by exploring uh, menus and goals for intervention. So when we're working with families and school systems, a uh, vast majority, I'd say 50%, there's only minor suggestions for change. <coughs> because the kids are doing fairly well and the issue is fairly minor. However, there's a more um, smaller subset where we're really gonna work hard to engage them in more parenting services because the chances are that despite their best intentions, they may not be able to pull off the kinds of changes that they hope to make. So that's core that key that we have um, good ideas about what would be a realistic venue for that family to engage in. So I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly. I've mentioned that we show videotape feedback to enhance performance. There's a literature on videotape feedback that this describes um, that but I want to get to the child and family profile. So this is how we give feedback to parents across all of our interventions. <coughs> the, the factor to focus in on in the feedback form, the child and family feedback form, is that we have a color from green to red. Green means it's an area of strength, and red means needs attention. And so we actually have marks on this profile that indicate whether it was from the mother, the father, or the videotape, that we draw this conclusion that something is a strength or that needs attention. We put it on the profile and then we discuss it with the family. And we go through each domain systematically, ending up with family management relationships. We end with family management relationships because that's the solution. We're gonna wanna provide them with some support on family management relationships, so it's easier to move into that from ending there than it would be if we move ended on some other factor. So that's the reason for the, the sequencing as it is. The, uh, the terms on the left-hand side, uh, we typically have this as a Word document. And so um, we might simplify the feedback form for many of our families. We may not include those exact terms, but in general, we try to give uh, norm-based feedback on the child's adjustment. So if the parent fills out a form, we have norms about that form. And if we say that it needs attention, it's because the child's behavior is outside the norms. So uh, that, that's empirically based. And so the families actually want to know often, why are you saying um, his behaviors are, are needs attention? we can honestly say that for other parents who filled out this form, the way you filled it out is more like families where the child is in trouble than families where there's uh, no issue. That's, uh, uh, we, we began with the child and behavior checklist, but that's copyrighted and they wanna charge you for every form. So we, uh, and it's also quite long and a bit detailed, over detailed. Uh, the strengths and difficulties is public domain, the norms are published, so anybody can use it at any time without any sort of repercussions. So we have a teacher, parent, and youth version of that, and we, we use that now. Those are the types of forms. The other measures are measures we developed, and those are also public domain. Anybody can use those. Um, and, and then for all these domains, we've, we've taken instruments you know psychologists love to design assessments and every time we as we design an assessment we include a hundred items a <clears throat> hundred items to measure ego strain a hundred items to measure anything uh, so that if you try to measure everything you're going to have a 10-hour assessment so there's been systematic research showing uh, using item analysis whether you know the 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 briefest version of that measure you could possibly um, mm -hmm. have. For example, depression can be reliably assessed with three or four items. 
just whether or not someone seems to be more depressed than not. Uh, anxiety, two or three items. Um, marital distress, probably one item, but we have two or three items. You know, if you're thinking about divorce and you're unhappy in the marriage, uh, typically that's a sign that your your marriage is in trouble. That's the 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 logic behind a broad but brief assessment. So, um, like I said, we <clears throat> we were we're really working. This all has a function, and that's to come up with some goals. So we by the end of the feedback session. As we're going through the feedback form, we're um, writing down potential goals for the parents. <coughs> we are working to take the parents' words and cast them into manageable goals for an intervention. So if the parent says, um, I just want uh, there to be less negativity in our family, right? That's, a, that's something that a, that a lot of parents, if you ask most parents who are coming into the clinic, they'll say they have communication problems with their adolescent. That's what they say. That's what they feel. That's how they experience it. So we'd recast that into, um, oh, less negativity. So one way for you and your partner to have less negativity would be to work better as a team uh, on uh, positive support for John. You know, so we cast that into a, a manageable goal. And if they say, and then we go back and forth a bit, sometimes parents will say, well, that's not exactly what I meant. Um, I want us to be able to solve problems and not, uh, not have more conflict. And then we can list uh, problem solving as a second goal. So we recast it in terms of what we have, um, the kinds of interventions that we're going to engage them in. And then at the bottom of this sheet is the type of contact. So this is like a contract. And we, um, at the end of the feedback session, have a contract, uh, and we sign it, and they sign it, and that's our agreement for interventions. The interventions that follow are based on the everyday parenting curriculum for the family checkup. They don't have to be. <coughs> it's uh, the uh, I develop the everyday parenting uh, curriculum with my colleagues, but it's basically the same thing as PMTO at the Oregon Social Learning Center. Uh, Triple P, um, Matt Sanders program, Carolyn Webster Stratton's program, Incredible Years. <coughs> if you look out in the in the field, almost all of the interventions that emphasize uh, family management are very very similar in my mind, and I don't know if they're significantly different. I don't think our intervention is significantly better than anybody else's. It's very similar, um, but we're. Uh, what might be unique about our approach is that after the feedback session, we may only focus on, on one or two sessions or three sessions um, based on what we assessed was the family's needs. <coughs> so we have a, you know, uh, a curriculum that follows. It's three domains. Positive behavior support is one domain. And basically positive behavior support is finding uh, prompting positive behavior in your children and adolescents, uh, giving them opportunities, uh, proactively met, you know, providing structure so that um, kids know what their expectations are, and then when you see positive behavior, acknowledging it in some, po in some way, providing incentives, and uh, the like. Setting healthy limits is um, a set of skills um, around uh, having clear rules about what what would be misbehavior, um, making sure that you have um, your state clearly stating those rules, having clear consequences if those rules are, are violated, and monitoring. Now, um, we have a whole uh, section on what we call sane guidelines for consequences. So basically, we're trying to work with parents to not overreact when they're setting limits or underreact. So we provide them with structure around consequences um, and using a variety of consequences. In the old parent training work, it was only time out. Time out was the only uh, major strategy for, for limit setting. Now we time out is certainly included, but we have other types of consequences that parents can use to fit the cultural differences of parenting and 
um, and the, um, the different family circumstances. So the last uh, domain is family relationship building. And so we see that um, the literature suggests that conflict is at the core of most of our uh, family disruption, and around conflict is poor communication, lack of listening, and also negotiating conflicts. So we have a set of skills around family relationship building, but which is precisely that. It's the idea that to have positive family relationships is an ongoing process, and they're built, not rather not just given. So those are the three domains. Uh, the family checkup is designed to activate mindful parenting, being proactive and monitoring, and then the follow-ups are skill-based domains. And those are the 12 independent sessions that we have in the everyday parenting curriculum. Um, and the incentives for behavior change is really positive behavior support. And then healthy limit setting is limit setting and monitoring. And then relationship skills is relationship building. So those are the three domains in the sessions that go with them. These are some strategies for having realistic, uh, realistic goals. And this is the menu of follow-up interventions. Now, um, I'm going to briefly go over this. Uh, then I'm going to skip all the specific slides on our outcome studies um, in the interest of time. But the, um, the approach that we're talking about has been tested in a variety of randomized trials. On the left-hand side, those are listed. Um, there's a Project Alliance uh, 1, Project Alliance 2. These are two uh, middle school projects. In the United States, we have elementary, middle school, and secondary. Middle school is 11 to 13 to 14. And it's an opportune time to intervene uh, early in adolescence. Um, and we've randomized a uh, 1,000 children in one study uh, to see whether or not that had an effect over the course of adolescence. And we found from Project Alliance 1 and Project Alliance 2 that we get fairly large reductions in uh, antisocial behavior and substance use and other uh, improvements in attendance and uh, improvements in grades as a function of the family intervention. When we analyze our data, it's engagement in the family checkup that makes the big difference. It's the high-risk families that engage in the family checkup in the school context that have better grades and uh, improved attendance, reduced antisocial behavior, and reduced drug use. So uh, what's the school context for, for this approach? which we call positive family support. So the school context is, <coughs> is this. So um, I'm not sure, are you familiar with the positive behavior intervention support system? I thought so. So uh, we come alongside that model. And for uni the universal, um, we have a family resource center in every school. And we have, um, we have parent screeners and we have parent resources in that family resource room. The second selected level is parent support. Uh, it's um, when, when kids don't respond to the universal in positive behavior support, they have a system called check-in and check-out. We uh, engage parents in that check-in and check-out, and so they provide incentives on good days and things like that for their kids. And then the last uh, for the individualized is the family checkup. And we have a web-based family checkup um, and parent management training in the context of the family resource room. So uh, when we set up a family resource room for, for a school, that becomes the center in which we, we engage families and we can do home visits or they can come into the school, whatever they prefer. In our early studies, they were um, efficacy studies, right? So we had a large research team. <clears throat> now we're at a place where we're trying to, we've streamlined the model and we're working with 40 schools in, in Oregon, uh, in the United States, to implement this model. We've learned a lot about how to make large scale change in schools and the system of how they engage families. And this describes it, uh, where we're at right now, but it's really quite closely based to the Project Alliance 1 study. 
Um, and we have a team that's uh, worked with schools and provides consultation so that they can improve their capacity to work more constructively with parents. Who are the people that are running this kind of program of uh, FCU? Are these psychologists, social workers, teachers, counselors, anyone? Right. So uh, it's, it depends on your context. In Sweden, they're the school counselors and the, and the staff that they have at the school employed to provide counseling services. In the U.S., because the money has been so tight the last 10 years, there are no school counselors left. So we have special education or um, school psychologists or um, sometimes vice principals. But typically, we, uh, I think ideally it would be the school counselor who ran the, instead of doing what they typically do, they would run the family resource room and they would be trained to work with families. That's the niche that we're working with. Uh, we, we follow a response to intervention uh, approach. So <clears throat> if we provide a universal for all families and then, then, then kids that don't respond to the universal get the second level and kids who don't respond to the second level get the family checkup. And, uh, and we adapt to the unique uh, ecology of each school, which basically says um, we work with the resources of the schools. And this is, we've learned so much about it, uh, resources because the states have very few, but it's places like Sweden and the Netherlands have, have decent resources. So it's much easier. Can, can you give me a sense of uh, how many parents in school would you engage typically? We're talking about 10, 100? Yeah, well, uh, we would say that uh, for a really well-functioning uh, school, that 25% of the parents wouldn't be engaged in at least the um, check-in and check-out where they're getting more regular feedback about their kids' behavior and attendance and they're, they're uh, supposedly providing more support on good days. About 5% would get the family checkup. So, you know, those that are the higher end, more difficult uh, cases, that you uh, spend time problem solving in your school, we would really right away try to engage them in a family checkup and get those parents on board with our plan. And the family checkup in itself uh, varies in terms of intensity? Yes, it varies in terms of intensity. Now, we've learned that in the large scale implementation in the United States, we've reduce the requirement that they give videotape feedback um, because um, we didn't have as skilled clinicians in our schools. We were worried that if we had unskilled people giving videotape feedback or collecting videotapes that eventually there would be a problem. And if we're talking about population change, we were worried about that. Um, you know, that's a, that's a point, that's an implementation choice point, I think with this model is whether or not to go that round. We're looking at a process where schools can be certified as a family-friendly school. Uh, and it would be a formal certification process, so, uh, and that it would be statewide or countrywide in, in, in progressive countries that are able to think that way. You, the United States is really problematic because we're so fragmented. Even in a state, it's very rare to get the state doing anything the same, um, but that's the goal. We, we already are putting the same energy and time and money and resources into managing schools, but we're not being systematic. And all we're really talking about is being more systematic in our approach. I believe, and I don't have the data to suggest this, but this is where I'm interested in collaborations, is that um, we could um, reduce costs of uh, schools by having them be more systematic rather than increase costs of you know bringing in new professionals or having um, new programs the the what the major one of the major problems I see in our our schools is that if I go to a public school in the states 
often I'll see a room full of programs. They'll have a program for bullying, they'll have a program for self-esteem, they'll have a program for drug use, they'll have a program for this. They'll have literally 10 programs are running at the same time. They, I've been to schools where they actually hire a person to coordinate the different prevention programs. Well, you don't need to necessarily, you could have one, one program, one system that prevents all of those outcomes. Uh, so that's the idea that we're trying to sell. And that's why we, we started to partner with uh, uh, Rob Horner and George Sugai because we saw them moving in that direction and I'm supportive of that direction. So we're, we're dovetailing into their system approach and we don't feel like we have ownership on it. Uh, we, we, it's more of a general trend towards providing positive behavior support for kids. We're just bringing into the, the parenting piece. So on concluding comments, um, my first uh, kind of closing summary is that embedding family interventions within agencies such as public schools and WIC is feasible and efficient. That um, we find that even for our high risk families, that in early childhood it's an average of three hours of uh, services per year and the higher risk families, it's more like, uh, for adolescents, it's like six hours per year to have intervention effects. So we can, if you accurately identify families' needs and, and engage them in the community rather than wait for them to come to the clinic, that you can have effects and it's relatively efficient. The families that are the most at risk are the most likely to engage in the family checkup. So this was a bit of a paradox because we uh, thought uh, when we started our research on prevention 25 years ago that we would have the hardest time engaging the highest risk families. Um, and that was partly because we were approaching them with one size fits all. Um, you know, will you belong to a, will you engage in a parenting uh, group, for example. Um, now we find that when we approach families individually and have a bit of skill on how we engage in, with them and, and get their interest and concerns, that we're much more likely to engage the highest risk families. Low risk families are more likely to say, no thanks, I, we're, we're doing okay. Uh, and that's a rational uh, approach to engagement. Um, although the effect sizes are small, if you look at our outcome studies, you won't see huge effect sizes. However, we're dealing with the whole population. Uh, so that's a small pop, small effect sizes uh, are meaningful at a larger community level. And uh, the key take home message is that the effects, effects are achieved by means of changes in the parenting practices that we're targeting. So that it's really important to show that for our science because it could be due to some other factor, but we know that if we positively engage parents that they will increase, increase their positive involvement and monitoring. And then finally, the, the model and findings are consistent with a public health approach to promoting behavioral health with brief periodic uh, support over time, increasing effect sizes. In one of our studies, we looked at the impact of yearly family checkups through early childhood on on the child's on the teacher's perception that the child was a behavior problem in the second grade of elementary school and we found that the more family checkups <clears throat> the less likely the teacher saw the child as a behavior problem as a large effect size uh, so this idea this dental model that uh, you know maintaining your the health of your uh, if your family is a is a process that you come to periodically over time and that if you provide supports around that that you can have re relatively large effects on the right people um, and then uh, I guess I just want to acknowledge that the work I talked about today is a um, a large part of a reflection of many colleagues these are the key colleagues that I think of uh, that have helped in many different ways as well as the support by National Institute of Drug Abuse here at the, in the States. And, uh, you know, we have two books. 
that uh, summarize these, this approach and a website, and uh, we'll be talking more. If you, on this last slide, if you get on this web, the Child and Family Center website, you can download all the publications by using this username and password. So all of that's really accessible. And, you know, you can download what you like.